Thank you. Thank you very much. Please sit. Thank you. Well, after an introduction like that, I better make sense here today. <laughs> I always like to tell the story of how people are never quite certain of how to describe you when you are out of office. So people say ex vice president, former vice president, you know, but let me just explain how it works, just so that in the future uh, you know exactly how to do it. So I must be described because I'm the vice president that has just left office. So I'm described as the immediate past vice president. The one who left before me, Namadi Sambo, will be described as the former vice president. And the one before that will be described as the one time. <laughs> one time. So, so very soon, I, I, hope, I hope very soon, very soon I will also become one time. That will take a bit of time. Thank you all very much. I, let me say first how very honored I am to have been invited to give this uh, talk to this very dynamic and forward-looking uh, leadership of Access Bank. And I'm glad that we're able to hold this lecture and not cancel it. Herbert had mentioned to me, as you've heard already, that he wanted me to uh, be here for this lecture. And there is a deep sense that one is keeping a promise to a loyal and dedicated and debated friend who would have done the same or even more. But I remember my friend and your colleague and friend today with much fondness. And I pray that um, his memory and his legacies will forever be an inspiration and a blessing. I, I, I know that um, for many of us, I mean, there is still a deep sense of mourning. And, and really, that is how it must be. But as they say, it's only in darkness that light truly shines. And I think that uh, the results that we're hearing, all of the way that the bank has held together and that the leadership of the bank has held together is evidence of the fact that what has been built will be sustained and that his memory and legacies will truly uh, continue to endure. And I want to uh, express again my sincere condolence first to my dear friend and brother, I give the chair of Access Bank, but also to all of you uh, and pray that the Lord God Almighty will continue to help this bank to achieve all of the dreams that uh, our brother and friend Herbert had. Thank you all very much. The theme of this leadership series is the future of work and adapting to a changing landscape. All I'm going to be talking about is that changing landscape. You know, and I'll leave the future of work to the experts, the human resource experts. I don't think anyone should argue against the proposition that the business of the leader is to understand trends, events, and policies and that may affect the communities or nations that they're in and the implications that there may be for the future of their businesses. The role of the leader then goes beyond merely nuts and bolts and technicalities of the particular business. Because the whole point of leadership is that you are showing the way. You are the pathfinder, the guide to hundreds of thousands. That role requires the prescience or the ability to predict the future. And a key component of that is the correct interpretation of defining trends and patterns which is why I think the impact of this leadership series and its importance cannot be overstated. You know, and I want us to recognize that as leaders in the financial industry, there are certain things that you ought to be paying attention to. What are the global conversations and decisions to, that need to be had and decisions that need to be taken? What are the trends and challenges that can have far-reaching impact across borders? What happens in one part, what happens in one part of the world affects practically every other part of the world. And that's just the reality of today. Whatever is going on somewhere else 
is having an impact here. And it is the business of leaders to ensure that they are fully aware of those things. I must say that for me, one of the very troubling findings is that both the public and private sectors of our country, Nigeria, and indeed in many parts of Africa, do not pay attention to several of these trends. International rules are being made every day. Conventions are being signed every day. But we find that in most of the tables where we're supposed to be represented, we're absent. For me, one of the major you know, uh, business of leaders is to listen, to pay attention to local and international trends and developments, and do some personal and corporate scenario planning based on information. Now, there are several crucial global and local trends that we must watch. And these include technology, climate change, population, especially demographic shifts that are taking place. Geopolitics, globalization, deglobalization, the new economic powers that are emerging, healthcare, especially the breakthroughs and the uh, transformative events happening in the healthcare sector, education, the challenges of the transformation in teaching and in learning. But so that we can be at least as exhaustive as possible, I'm only going to discuss two of these trends, just two, climate change and technology. And of course, I'm discussing them separately. And I'll leave the rest to possible questions that you may have during the Q&A session. My approach will be to highlight the issues that you as leaders in the financial services industry in particular, and as significant economic ac actors across Africa, should take note of. And let's take, you know, and, and then some of the other side issues as we go along. But let's just take climate change as a first, uh, as a first trend that I think we should watch. Africa, as you know, is warming faster than anywhere else in the world. So it means that we'll be the first to hit the disaster. It has and is still experiencing some of the most devastating weather events, and it's the least prepared of all the continents to deal with the damage and devastation to lives and property. And of course, it is very evident that we simply don't have the kinds of buffers that other continents have. And as you know, these consequences of climate change, flooding, drought, excessive heat, rising sea levels, etc., are problems that are caused by the activities, especially the industrial activities of the global north. So we're not responsible for what we're experiencing. The global north, the industrialized nations of the world, are the ones that are responsible. Africa is, in fact, uh, by far, the least emitting region where the, we emit the least of all uh, of dangerous gases. But that has not saved us from any of the problems and consequences. And the question that we should ask is, what are these issues that have been thrown up by this climate crisis? The first is the future of oil and gas. Now that I have some water. I'm so sorry, I needed to. Sorry. So I was saying that the first is the future of oil and gas. That's, of course, very important to the financial industry and to our economy generally. What is the future? Everyone agrees that emissions from fossil fuels are the most uh, problematic. We all agree that emissions from fossil fuels are the most problematic of all uh, the dangerous gases that there are. So, the next problem, of course, is how to have a transition that is just and fair to everyone, right? Because we must transit from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And how do we transit from fossil fuels to renewable energy in such a way that is just and fair to rich and poor countries alike? Every one of us agrees that there must be that transition. Now, the 
problem that we've experienced is not so much that there is a disagreement about the transition. The problem is how the wealthier countries of the world have taken that have taken that transition, how they expect that transition to take place. One of the critical issues, of course, is that the wealthier nations of the world want to stop investments in gas, oil and gas projects in developing countries. And that is so for financial institutions. The World Bank, for instance, already has a policy. That policy, of course, is affecting the AFDB. So that, by and large, a lot of the development financial institutions are saying that we don't, we're not going to be investing in either downstream or upstream oil and gas in Africa and, of course, in the developing world. Now, that is just part of the problem. Add to that that countries, the UK, the US, the EU generally, are also saying the same thing. That, look, in order to control emissions, we are not going to be investing in oil and gas, fossil fuel projects generally in the developing world. And we are at various stages of agreements or disagreements on that issue. Again, you find that political leadership in Africa is not involved in those conversations. Of course, the private sector is also left out of most of those conversations, despite the fact that this is bound to have tremendous impact on the future of one of the most important resources that we have. So the, the question has always been, how do we transit? How do we do a fair thing? But it, it seems that typically, you know, countries are looking out for themselves. Rich countries are looking out for themselves. Poor countries have no choice, you know, but you just follow what the rich countries are doing. And just by the fact that there is no dispute, every one of us agrees across the North and South divide that there must be a transition from fossil fuels, yet we are at, at cross purposes. Now, one of the other things I think we should take note of on this is that, so all rich countries, oil and gas rich countries, usually energy poor countries in Africa, such as Nigeria, Algeria, Egypt, Ghana, Senegal, and Mozambique, where they are saying, look, whatever we do, gas must be a transition fuel. And I think the argument is clear enough. Gas is still cheap, it's still the cheapest option for power, and must be a transition or a bridge fuel. As far as renewable energy is concerned, yes, it is getting cheaper and cheaper every day. But we must still use gas, for instance, in Nigeria and several other countries. LPG, in particular, is seen as clean, is the clean cooking option to replace kerosene stoves and uh, charcoal and oil, which are responsible for millions of fatalities from indoor air pollution. Also, there are many countries, especially those without hydro, that cannot integrate much more uh, with wind or solar power without balancing sources. And that's of often the best uh, technical and financial option, just for balancing the weed. But perhaps a more interesting point is that even in Africa, we increase the electricity with fuel that is consumed by the overwhelming developing people in Africa by 300%. Using gas as the main source, global annual emissions will already rise by 0.62%. That is less than the average year in the increase over the past decade. So even if we were to abuse the influence, we still won't be emitting anything. Yet we are on the part of the, the, it is almost as if we are on the floor. But what is the response, you know, uh, of, of this world in Asia? I think that, you know, come through that. Where development finance institutions, you know, are there saying you're still probably going to withdraw from, you know, fossil fuel investment, especially in the developing government. You know, why the world bank took a decision on this, that we had more fossil fuel to buy human weapon, port on it. But it's, I guess, that the sweeper indeed. You know, when you're still starting, I can find that even the AFT, they don't have major metrics. The person who to your board is being built by uh, the world bank, so, well, uh, um, yeah, NDPs, yeah, international demons. Who are force at B, not is the city bit. 
Now, there was still more reason for depriving developing countries of funding for gas plants is because they're saying we want to reduce global emissions and achieve a net zero target. But that hypocrisy itself, yeah, was laid bare when the Russia and Ukraine war started and their shortage is spread all over Europe. The same EU countries that were aggressively negotiating, that were saying we're not investing anymore in oil and gas for the of developing countries, were negotiating aggressively with developing countries, including the for gas. And it's incredible because you know, for that, I can still give it up shame and tell you, or you know, the last six days for them, but they are addressing me in a wish getting for gas for them, the from, from uh, countries of Africa. So, the second uh, yeah. it is that most of the wealthier parties, including the US, there, in China, they are, and uh, several Asian countries, still include this as a middle pillar of their multi decade decolonization of that. And the relevant studies show that oil and gas will continue to be in high demand for the next four decades before beginning to tape off. So the wealthier countries are not doing that significantly in oil and gas investments. But we in the global south will disband those investments and not be in the reckoning as major suppliers in the trading scenario. Unfortunately, a lot of these rules were made but even were knowing but for what CEO. And, you know, and we see this recurring. There's not that significant threat for uh, investments in oil and gas. It, it, and that is the availability, continuing availability of insurance. I know of course insurance is critical to most of the projects at uh, any of these large projects. So there's a great deal of pressure on how on international insurers and reinsurers, especially from climate activists, not to install fossil fuel projects anyway. Thankfully, you know, success has been limited for the big international insurers companies that appear to lie in the power and line for now. But that is only for now, because already many large European insurers have shifted away from underwriting uh, cost uh, or any of the mining projects, coal power, the electric plants, etc. And Russell can chop on the big uh, insurance companies. And now it's new underwriting criteria that to require oil and gas extraction projects to reduce their methane emissions. So we're seeing right to I didn't really show us something that begin to think that way. Perhaps if everybody say don't touch for some fossil fuel projects, we are to we are essentially. But the main threat to the fossil fuel industry is the increasing use of electric electric vehicles, the e-mobility uh, revolution. Many countries, including major buyers of our oil, being tickled, are already setting dates of phasing out combustion engine cars. While combustion engine cars are phased out all over the world and electric vehicles become cheaper, especially with better storage technology, including daily, and that we see everywhere. We here will have no choice but to abandon combustion engine cars too. The question that strategic leaders in the industry should be asking is how long before international financing for oil and gas projects finally drive? And how long do we have to wait for well, vehicles or electric vehicles to replace combustion engine vehicle? Can we even have fought in best heavily today in auto gas, in CNG hard vehicles for example? Can we afford to best heavily in that? If there's a risk that if first went to gas products, we try it. And then what next? I think we in Africa must be thinking seriously of how to become clean energy superpowers. First, you know, we have some of the best renewable energy potential in the world. I knew an energy, especially solar power, there's not only a point but we also have very low intermittency or seasonality, as they call it. At this means that peak, as in other power, unlike other projects, we have radiation sometimes for 12 hours, 13 hours, I wonder which makes it possible to reliably provide renewable 
There is no the power continuous industrial production for extended periods of time. Strikingly, the lowest cost setup today, solar, wind, and power to storage, it, uh, in order to get renewable this look for uh, industrial activity, is twice as expensive in Germany as it is in Nigeria. I'm not quite a bit of work on that in uh, the primary actual platform for Africa. I'm demonstrated by you know, that it is cheap to do this in Nigeria that I would have. Like, we know, fact, solar PVs for Nigeria and in Kenya vastly outperform Europe's best industry sectors, I even Europe's top in these sports. So the same battery supported PV system in Nigeria would enable the base load that is eight times as large as in Germany, and is paying 1.8 times. So we are set to be with renewable energy capital to be able to really industrial, yeah, the really industrial capital. Uh, and I, when I say this, I, I, I mean Africa. The second uh, thing that I'll need the second thing we need to do is, is the production and export of low carbon fuels. Now, these fuels, especially hydrogen and ammonia, will be critical to the transition between that same world, giving their potential especially in decarbonizing hard to electrify sectors, such as cement, uh, steel production, fueling trucks, the uh, big ocean wave, uh, the vessels, uh, heavy do all that. And of course, balancing grids as well. So primarily, wherever you're going to use renewable energy resources, yeah, that going to put that, uh, looking for situations where there'll be no intermittency disruption. Right. These uh, fuels will be the best. And we have the IEA just recently, yeah, I mean, their net zero 2050 will have said that every scenario that they are looking at anticipates that trade in hydrogen and ammonia will rise from almost nothing at it is today to almost one third of all energy related transactions. So ammonia and hybrid is when we take one third of an anti-related and that's either that that's their the prediction. The past five years have seen tremendous growth in the blue and green hydrogen use. And there's so many green hydrogen products in Africa that are reaching our final investment is you know, right? Angola, Namibia, South Africa have already the media in May 2023 signed a 10 uh, billion, 10 US, 10 billion US dollar deal with hyphen hydrogen energy to continue with advanced PB to start this towards the development of uh, their green hydrogen plant, which when done will supply 300,000 tons of PE energy annually using wind and solar power. Angola is also said to become the first exporter of green ammonium to uh, uh, Germany by 2025. The full capacity when they are done would be about 280,000 uh, tons annually. South Africa is planning to produce 5 million tons of big hydrogen annually by 2040. Other countries such as Egypt, Kenya, Morocco, Mauritania have green hydrogen production goals as well. But Again, a word of caution is that because many of these countries are going for the same market, there's a need to avoid the type of competition for export markets that may need to erase to the bottom of prices. So uh, developing a unified African strategy for green hydrogen about great disposal, which is what the rest of the world is doing, Chile and the countries, et cetera, America, was already working together. We in Africa also need to work. Okay, so all the development in that respect is the inauguration of the African Green Hybrid Alliance sometime in May 2033. But we hope that this will work on prices so that we're not competing against ourselves and bring the prices to the law. A separate issue to watch uh, is the trade restrictions and other climate mitigation measures that have been introduced and considered by many global North countries, again, ostensibly to reduce carbon emissions. So there are clear regulations that are, going, that are being made 
No, that ostensibly are meant to go to work at the motions. The EU in particular is making several it's because, and we need to take a little. The largest, uh, we're the outer cut for us is the largest exporter to Europe in all of the continent, we have the largest, especially, especially of uh, uh, certain types of products, like aluminum, uh, steel, uh, and then several uh, crops of produce. But the EU uh, has recently uh, did place something they call the carbon border adjustment management system. Now, this carbon border adjustment management system is simply is a levy which is to be posed up products imported into the EU, but the carbon dioxide emissions that are embedded in those products by reason of the source of power in making the world. So a manufacturer that is using uh, gas right down there as its power source in its plants will be subject to these uh, carbon border layers. So manufacturers of cement, steel, and fertilizer importing to the EU will have to pay them because most of these manufacturers and fortunate manufacturers from Africa are on the welcome world. Most of our factors, of course, use either oil, gas, or diesel. And now, this is one of those regulations that was likely developed without any input from, in, from the countries that export to that deal. And most of the countries, of course, nobody was consulted. And uh, all the, of course, the implication of well, this for Africa, it will move we'll, we'll somewhere in the order of what, 25 billion US dollars annually just from this sea government. Now, the EU is Africa's largest trading partner, almost 162 billion in imports in 2021 alone. So, we're big, you know, we're big importers in the EU. One would have felt that would be inviters of the table, or that would invite ourselves to the table. Mozambique at its force 97% of its aluminium to the EU. Aluminium accounts for 20% of its exports and its GDP could fall by as much as 1.5% from these uh, CBAM There's also a new EU deforestation law, and this is a deforestation regulation. And this is particularly bad because this will affect practically all African countries because there's a lot of export of uh, commodities such as palm oil, cattle, soy, coffee, timber, rubber. Along with the derived products like beef, furniture, chocolate. Yeah. What that will say is that all of these things must be deforestation free. In other words, if you are exporting, say, soybeans or coffee to the EU, you must certify that it is, your product is deforestation free. Now, what does that mean? What does deforestation just of tree beans. It, it, it means that the goods produce, of produced on the land that is not deforested. So if you found it, right? And of course, you plant it usually in the forest somewhere. But you must show evidence that you did not cut down trees at all in order to clear it to the farm. Now, that is a tough one, but in most in most of our family communities, we absolutely need to bring down the uh, trees and uh, all uh, and, and, and a lot of vegetation just to be able to establish the farm. So, you know, that for micro and small and small businesses, the application on the end of the is fairly up to a right? Yeah. I mean, the that regulation emphasizes that deforestation and free means Boots produced on the land not subject to deforestation in any way or oil deprivation. And the deal applies where deforestation is illegal in the countries that are exporting. So we're in very tight, very, very tight deal. Nobody asked us, nobody calls out at us. We also, we also ask many questions. There's a little regulation which would affect African businesses significantly. And uh, which it has got video input here. Uh, but I, I think we'll just need well, to so I don't spend too much time. I think we'll stick very briefly about carbon markets. We, of course, you know, uh, this is a major benefit of the energy transition. 
and there's a growing awareness of uh, awareness of this potential. Federal government of Nigeria recently joined several African countries by presenting its own carbon market activation plan. The Fortnite carbon market offers huge potential for profit. And we are at the moment uh, at the point where the market, the real market, is being designed. And I believe that this is the time for the financial services industry to get the world. Some countries, of course, are further in the house. Kenya has a very thoughtfully considered law and regulation. And I think that they have put more well for us. Yeah. And again, the African Government Markets Initiative has offered support to countries that are involved in their uh, carbon market to be short plans. I think this is, this is the moment where we ought to actually get it for But this is from the very large market. But there's already a scandal. There's already a scandal for large areas of land in Africa by wealthy populace. That's just incredible. You know, for this common credit, you know, through the avoidance of deforestation. And it's a very, a very curious development because you can actually get carbon credit by avoiding deforestation. And so we now have a wealthy company, you know, uh, that are buying on that to Africa, ostensibly for conservation so that it can get some carbon credit for it. Let a major company for it, that's out of the UAE, that has signed about five MOUs and paid for large amounts of land, forest land, in, in, in Africa. For example, that company paid for only fit at 18 million hectares, roughly, you know, uh, uh, I think it's about 18 million hectares, and roughly a ten of uh, land in, uh, uh, there's, in, uh, there's in Tanzania, I think, the what of almost 10% of the land area. In Zambia, I think about 5-8% of the land area. You uh, then, uh, have land uh, also the right area, the bottom, yeah, close to 8%. I'm talking about actual land area, to the bottom. Yeah. And there are, there are countries that were almost 20% brand areas we bought it. Now, the question of course is how this deals are pretty tough, because a lot of things are, you know, nobody lives exactly how you know, they start back and no. Yeah. So communities, we know what was going to happen from a level the road, where communities that we say, look, this forest belongs to us, this land belongs to us, about, you know, countries that don't deal that have sold off but I think to advocate and move for conservation purposes and all that, you know. And you know, the state company is already up between Angola, um, which is also a well for us to be a uh, country for a similar, to, uh, a similar deal. So they said, no, this is a lot that's going on. I will just have to pay the import potential to win developments because we wake up one morning, and I remember you know, speaking to you uh, a group of uh, after that he's got he does about like, a month or two. And everyone seemed completely aware, even people from the countries where I was talking about. But I seemed completely unaware of civil this transaction that take a faith. You know, but these are the things that are given, and we really just need to pay uh, more attention. The second uh, trend, which I'd like us to observe as technology, and of course, I'm sure we're all very familiar with how technology, uh, the continuing advancements and developments in AI, machine learning, water, computing, robotics, automation, big data, all of these technological advancements are what they do. AI, in particular, is set to dramatically change practically every and commerce, as we use it. Justin asked me for his centers at uh, Mathematics State University and Stanford announced at the invention of a new uh, generative artificial intelligence model, which can design new antibiotics to stop the spread of one of the most dangerous uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. In and this is just AI working by itself, as it were. 
generate AI, um, AI software that is able to do all of these types of wonderful things. The University of Arkansas, uh, March 1st, May just March 1st, just uh, last month, made the startling, uh, announced the startling result of a test that they conducted between 451 human beings, I chat GPT, of course, and Joe well from here. To find out which, whether between the humans and chat GPT, which of them was superior in divergent thinking, in other words, coming up in different you know, answers to different scenarios, and unfortunately, chat GPT is even bored on the fiction. So, look, and, and this is chat GPT in its first iteration. Who knows what we are doing it? So already we've seen how artificial intelligence and you know machine learning is poised to transform even the financial services industry in simple. So of course, already uh, we know that uh, AI, AI driven uh, chatbots and virtual assistants can provide 24 7 customer service, offering quick responses to requirement and even personalized uh, financial advice. And in uh, Axon Bank is where I am of several. Uh, practically everybody else in uh, the technology, and I was uh, teasing, I think, about Daniel. Well, yes, well, and I, that I, you know, that Access Bank already has uh, the found African fund and all sorts of other sort of setups to ensure that at least Africa, that at least Access Bank's own technology problems are resolved. Although he pointed out to me that uh, actually, yeah. The way this is designed is to resolve problems in the industry, not just locally, but across Africa. So that I think is a very good thing you need. But these technologies, yeah. So these technologies can learn, yet yeah, these AI can learn for customer interactions to even improve their self So they are self-teaching, you know, they are self-propagating in so many, in so many ways. AI systems now we will have superior skills for identifying patterns that indicate fraud by analyzing transactions uh, data in real time. So they can say, look, fraud, this is a fraudulent or this is a fraudulent pattern. And AI's traditional spend, and this again is a preview date, is the automation of routine tasks and processes and significantly reducing operational costs for financial institutions. Now, this includes everything from customer onboarding to compliance checks, even regulatory compliance can be done now, almost every time, accurate by AI across different jurisdictions if you wish, and can now be handled, of course, more quickly and more accurately. How about stock and currency training and all that? Now you have AI algorithms that can accurately analyze vast amounts of data including news and social media to make predictions about market investments to even execute trades, you know, at optimal times. And that's the same for credit and risk assessment. AI can process complex data sets to assess the credit risk more accurately, considering factors even beyond our traditional uh, credit scores. Now, the thing, of course, is that you know, uh, when you do this, especially for risk assessments, they can lead to more nuanced assessments, potentially looking up credit to previously, you know, undersell markets while manage you uh, lenders with the same time. But even more interesting is what AI can do in predictive analytics. And that's an area where I think, you know, uh, a lot is going to happen in giving faster various so AI's ability to process and analyze large data sets can help predict evil economic trends, making businesses and investors wasn't able to be able to make more inferent decisions. But what is more intriguing is the book quantum computing. All we are seeing today is set to advance dramatically where uh, uh, quantum computing actually begins to process and analyze vast amounts of data because they can analyze much faster and cluster computers. And this is particularly really much for applications that depend on large scale data analysis, such as natural language processing, and image recognition. These are big areas. 
So we've tried, haven't seen anything else. There's so much eating. And it may just be days, not even and these days. If you look up any of the, uh, any of the technology makers use and over, just think that this stuff, something new is happening there with him over. There are new announcements every day, new areas didn't go to never see when they hear. So the next question, of course, is so what happens with jobs, which is, of course, a very important issue. Why the AI is taking over with well, this results in human redundancies in the market? What I've found is that a lot of the research at Batteo is a big more and so point. One thing that is clear is that AI machine learning tools are particularly good at automating routine rep uh, repetitive tasks. You know, sort of data entry, transaction processing, and basic customer service requires a lot of jobs that are marrying if the ball goes dust, obviously at a higher risk of being affected. But there will be new jobs in the world, and uh, new rules, which are being created, particularly in such areas as AI development, data, harvesting, cyber security, even the AI and the Twitter's you a big conversation all over the and what roles will emerge for jobs that require emotional intelligence, creative thinking, the strategic judgments, you know, which are capabilities that AI has not ruined yet. Mm -hmm. Some would say AI yeah, that don't mm -hmm. particular uh, capability. Also, human oversight of AI system for creating new jobs, because there will be a need for human oversight to uh, AI system, especially for roles that are focused on ensuring fairness and on the big uh, transparency of AI applications. One of the critical implications of this revolution, of the AI revolution, as it transformed the job, job landscape, the financial services particularly, is the importance of scaling and rescaling workers. Workers need to adopt, adapt to these changing demands for their roles, which will increasingly require digital literacy there are needs to work along AI systems and skills in sort of areas of both of data analysis and interpretation. And no one is yet sure of what the impact of AI will be in our third of employment in the rules, particularly in financial industry. While some jobs may be lost or significantly changed, new ones will emerge and the overall demand for electrical services may increase as these technologies that may be more efficient and accessible for actual products and services. One thing that we are bound to see sooner than later are uh, the reaction of our labor organizations. Because obviously in labor organizations that we are asking, uh, we fitting with the top boxes and negotiating with employers and labor and we all in sectors, especially on how to prevent needless job losses retraining programs and policies to foster uh, job leadership in emerging areas. So there's going to, I, I think that there's going to be, in my view, some uh, concerns, they look like said, around what to do next and how to do what to do next. I want to show you a quick clip video. This is, uh, so when you might have missed this on social media, why don't you feel very quick on this, 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 this clip. Let's see, uh, you just, let's see. Are you able to show this? Today, I stand with you with a profound sense of duty and determination. I'm announcing my interest in purchasing Access Bank PLC and turning it into a global bank. I humbly ask for your support on this. Thank you. What <laughs> hell? I, I thought I thought that that might catch your attention. Now this is my own, and and, and this is just to show what is possible. Here. This is my own amateur in Dalmi. I had on TV I went to. If I, as a complete amateur, and make uh, Elon Musk say that he wants to take go back, so if I post this on social media. Of course, something will happen to shares. I don't know the search for like cancer, right? So you can imagine the mischief that is possible. 